good morning or good afternoon according to your time zone. I'm Dimitrios Goulis, a reproductive endocrinologist from Greece and the immediate past president of the European Menopause and Anthropos Society, the EMAS. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this EMAS webinar on practical aspects of menopausal hormone treatment. Today we'll discuss about regimes, dosages, duration of treatment and adverse effects handling. Indeed, one of the main issues, if not the major one for prescribing menopausal hormone treatment is the art to tailor it according to the needs of a specific woman. Today, we'll discuss exactly this issue. What are the tips and tricks for, for, to achieve this target? Dr. Tobias Johan de Villers from South Africa will discuss with us the need, what we need to know about MHT for the treatment of early menopausal symptoms whereas Dr. Nozer Seriar from India will give us all tailor-made solutions for the use of MHT in clinical practice. And as a genuine Indian, he will even use modern mantra. Before we begin, Emaz would like to thank Abbott for their support and for making this new webinar series possible. Nevertheless, we must clarify that the scientific program and its contents are exclusively the responsibility of Emaz. So on top of English, this event is translated and you can choose one of the following languages, Chinese, Mandarin, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, or Ukrainian. You may select the language by clicking on the interpretation widget you will find in your Zoom panel. Please locate it now. Moving on to technical issues, you have entered this webinar into listen-only mode. This means that your microphone is muted so we do not pick up any noise from your end. We do welcome and encourage you to submit your text questions via the Q&A widget located in your Zoom panel. Once again, please search for it now for the Q&A widget. You can enter your questions at any time and we will read and discuss them during the end of this webinar. You can also use the chat uh, widget for comments, not for questions. Finally, I remind you that we are recording today's webinar and it will be accessible on the MAS website. So it's my great pleasure to present you Dr. Tobias Johans de Villers from South Africa. Dr. de Villers is a consultant gynecologist with a special interest in gynecological endocrinology, menopausal medicine and osteoporosis. He is, between other achievements, the director of the Panorama Bone Densitometry Clinic and the Clean Trial Center for Clinical Studies in Cape Town. And he has served for many international organizations, including the International Menopause Society, the IMS, and the International Osteoporosis Foundation, the IOF. Only in 22, he lectured in more than 26 webinars and presented it in eight countries. So Toby, thank you very much for today's presence. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to try to work the share screen. And um, I think we, it looks like we are in business. We go there and we just put it full screen. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and for the chance uh, to speak to such a distinguished audience tonight. Um, <clears throat> Now, the topic tonight will be the menopausal hormone therapy for the management of early menopausal symptoms, all you need to know. And I'd like to thank EMAS as well as Abbott for the opportunity. Now, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Mrs. M to you. So she's a 54-year-old lady. She complains of severe hot flashes. So it's very frequent day and night associated with severe sweating. It interferes with her daily activities and wakes her up at night. Her last menstrual period was 14 months ago. She has an uncomplicated personal and family history. A recent mammogram was normal, normal fasting blood glucose and cholesterol. She's tried the normal stuff, exercise, diet, stress management, other lifestyle modifications, as well as botanicals from the health shop to no avail. So now she desperately needs your help. And this is very often the situation that we are confronted to in daily practice. So just a few basics. She's been 14 months since her last menstrual period. 
So uh, she is then definitely in the early menopause and uh, according to the straw classification. And this is the time where vasomotor symptoms are most likely, although it can start a little bit earlier. Um, <clears throat> now, vasomotor symptoms is <clears throat> one of the complex of symptoms that can characterize the early menopause. Um, and that is really what we're going to concentrate on today. So if we talk about vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes, as we say in South Africa and in Europe, or hot flash, uh, flashes, as they say in the United States, we see that this phenomenon will affect the majority of postmenopausal women, but it can be either severe, as in our case tonight, or it can be mild or moderate. Now, generally, the symptoms will last for five to seven years, but in the past couple of years, it's become quite evident that in an underestimated group of women, probably about five to 10 percent, it will unfortunately last indefinitely. And hot flashes or vasomotor symptoms have a definite different racial and geographical um, occurrence. Now, the first step is normally just to go the lifestyle options. I'm not going to really spend time on that, but this is really effective in cases of severe vasomotor symptoms. So what we're really dealing here, and this is from the practitioner's toolkit for managing menopause by Sue Davis, uh, we can see that we are in this middle leg here, patients with moderate to severe bothersome menopausal symptoms. So there are two ways in which we can go. We can either go to systemic hormone therapy, and that's what we're going to concentrate on tonight, or we can go to systemic non-hormonal treatment, which I will mention. So what are the real indications for menopausal hormone therapy? Well, menopausal hormone therapy is certainly the most effective treatment for vasomotor symptoms and improvement of quality of life in the early menopause. Um, it also improves sleep quality. It also improves quality of life. It is effective in the treatment of genitourinary syndrome of menopause. It prevents bone loss and fractures. And it has mild effects against menopause-induced anxiety and depression, but should not be used to treat clinical depression in postmenopausal women as first line of therapy. Other potential benefits, but which has clearly been shown in the follow-up studies, is that it actually reduces mortality. That's very important because patients may actually have the fear that it will make them die earlier. It also reduces cardiovascular disease on the long run. It reduces colorectal carcinoma, improves glucose tolerance. It may improve cognitive function, especially brain fog in the peri and early postmenopause and it may prevent dementia in later life, and more about that later. So what are the potential adverse events? Well, we do have a dictum of saying that it should be instituted or started in the first 10 years after menopause before the age of 60. So if you started outside of it, especially in high doses, oral therapy and long duration of treatment, it may be associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, but not if started timely in the early menopause. Um, there can be an increased risk of um, VTEs, uh, venous thrombolic episodes, but this is extremely unlikely also in the first 10 years of the menopause. If it occurs, it is normally only with oral administration of estrogen or with the metabolically active progestogens. So this excludes natural progesterone or diderogesterone. The question of whether it poses an increased risk of dementia or whether it actually protects against dementia is very, very um, topical at the moment. So we have several prospective studies um, that actually show that if started early in menopause, it actually protects against dementia. Um, in 2002, with the results actually 2004 of the WIMS a part of the um, Women's Health Initiative, that effect could not be shown and there was actually an increased risk of dementia, but only in patients older than the age of 65 
or patients who received a post um, therapy with medroxyprogesterone ast uh, aspirate, um, MPA. Then last year there was one, or this year there was one Danish population-based study that did show an increased risk of dementia irrespective of when started. But I think there are many, many uh, problems with the study. And as said by the authors themselves, it should not be seen as a causal relationship. The way I interpret it, especially in view of the other studies, is <clears throat> that it in fact maybe just reflected a group of people at risk of dementia later who presented with vasomotor symptoms. So I think that the jury is still out, but for patients giving um, a given MHT in the early part of menopause, I personally believe that it will rather protect than be associated with an increase of dementia. Breast cancer, probably the reason why most patients would be apprehensive of taking it. Well, when we, uh, they used um, CEE alone, in the WHI study, it was not um, associated with an increased risk of breast cancer, and in follow-up, definitely no increased mortality. In the um, combined group, which used, again, MPA, there was a small increase in risk, and that equated to one extra case per thousand women years, but over the follow-up period, there was no increased risk of uh, mortality. So that's very, very important again. We know that it, there can be increased risk of gallstones, cholecystitis, cholecystectomy, but this can probably be avoided by using the transdermal route. In case of estrogen-dependent malignancies, contraindications certainly active ER-positive disease. It is contraindicated. Um, but what about triple negative breast cancer where there are no estrogen receptors? There's still divided opinion uh, in that group. My personal opinion is that it can be given to triple negative breast cancer patients. And there's even work to show that it may improve the outcome. What about survivors of breast cancer? It's a relative contraindication. And in, please interpret the habits to liberate in Stockholm studies with caution. In selected cases, I will use um, uh, menopausal HRT for survivors who just have such a poor quality of life that you virtually have no other option. In terms of a family history, it's generally not a contraindication, so do risk assessment in a model such as GALE. Your BRCA1 and 2 gene mutations, they're mostly triple negative tumors, and but menopausal hormone ser uh, therapy is certainly not indicated after risk-reducing surgery such as breast and um, bilateral mastectomy and a bilateral ophorectomies. What about endometrial carcinoma? Um, after hysterectomy, estrogen alone is commonly preferred as it has a better effect on the breast. Um, but if a patient has an endometrial carcinoma, it is better to give a post therapy. And um, especially so in patients who had an advanced stage endometrial cancer or with endometrial stromal sarcomas or lyomas sarcomas. We do not give it in case of undiagnosed uterine bleeding. Ovarian cancer, although estrogen alone may be associated with a slight increase in diagnosed ovarian carcinoma, after ovarian cancer, it's generally safe except for granulosa cell um, tumors and for low-grade serious carcinoma. So <laughs> what about VTEs and active VTE? Definitely in contraindicated in thrombophilias. You have to individualize. But most of these patients were often on anticoagulation, and then you can consider transdermal um, uh, menopausal hormone therapy. But generally, avoid if it is thrombophilia with a previous VTE and not on anti anticoagulation. And carefully consider transdermal E2 plus P4 or didrogesterone if thrombophilia is present without um, a previous VTE. But unfortunately, we have no specifically designed studies, and most of the recommendations are inference from studies which aren't really designed to give the answers. And a patient with a previous VTE without a thrombophilia, have a look at the cause, but you can consider, again, transdermal E2 with progesterone or diregesterone. 
um, untreated or uncontrolled cardiovascular disease is definitely a, a contraindication, but not if it's treated and then severe um, liver disease. So the use of menopausal hormone therapy is a personal decision taken by the woman healthcare provider based on the um, uh, benefit risk profile. So this is very important. You've got to be absolutely sure that the benefit is going to be greater than the risk. Now, the benefit risk ratio is most likely favorable if it's initiated within 10 years of the menopause or before the age of 60, the so-called window of opportunity. Now, there is no mandatory rule to stop menopausal hormone at any stage. If, for instance, you use it to prevent bone loss, um, if you're going to stop it, you're just going to increase the bone loss. But initiating menopausal hormone therapy outside the window of opportunity should take into account that there will definitely be no um, cardiovascular benefit and with a possible increased risk of stroke and MI, VTE, um, although it will still be effective against the prevention of bone loss and fracture. So our, poss our possible benefit to risk ratio will change if you start after the age of 60, which is not a, com a con complete, uh, absolute contraindication, but bear that in mind. Our hormones that we have, the estrogens, whether it's CEE or whether it's E2, will depend on whether you live in the United States or in Europe. Estetrol is a new fetal estrogen that may have some <clears throat> advantages. It will be shortly available. It may already be available in some of your countries. The tibolone steer will <clears throat> generally just fall under the group of opposed uh, menopausal hormone therapy. Testosterone, we'll just allude to that just now. In terms of the progestogen which is being used, I think it's very important to realize that not all progestins are the same. Um, the better ones to use would be micronized progesterone or diderogesterone as they have the best um, <clears throat> uh, uh, fixing to the progesterone receptor without the stimulation of other um, receptors. <clears throat> so if we continue our route of administration, there is an increased risk of VTE with oral menopausal hormone therapy, but the absolute risk in women smaller than 60 is small, and it correlates with dose, the formulation of progestogen. Again, it's less uh, of a risk when you use progesterone or didogesterone. Obesity, obesity, and the age of initiation. Um, first past hepatic clearance can be avoided with non-oral routes, such as transdermal, vaginal, or rectum, which will obviously lower the risk of VTE. Although estrogen can be absorbed in the non-oral route, Madroki um, um, micronized progesterone is not adequately absorbed by the skin, so it will not offer endometrial protection. You should be very careful. Okay, <clears throat> should transdermal therapy thus be the only way of giving hormone therapy? Certainly not. Patient preference should be considered. It really doesn't matter a lot um, if you start before the age of, of 60, but under these few conditions, it's probably better to go transdermal, um, and I think that's fairly logical. So opposed or unopposed, so in non-hysterectomized women, you will need a progestogen for adequate anemetrial protection, but this comes at a small price of dilution of the beneficial effects of the estrogen. So then hysterectomized women should be prescribed estrogen-only therapy unless there's a history of moderate to severe endometriosis a subtotal hysterectomy, or as we previously said, if the hysterectomy was done for endometrial carcinoma. And this will optimize the beneficial effects of estrogen and minimize the potential adverse effects of some of the progestogens on breast. We always start with the lowest effective dose and then titrate upwards if necessary till the lowest effective dose on vasomotor symptoms. It's very important to realize we do not chase blood levels as it is very difficult to interpret the blood levels. So we go for alleviation of symptoms. The length, again, as I said, for the most appropriate length of time, depending on the indication. And just remember that an indication 
for vasomotor symptoms may extend beyond the 60 years. And if it's used for bone, it virtually always will. The prescription of compounded hormone preparations is not recommended uh, for various reasons, mostly because there's no safety data, there's no consistency or quality data, and it's basically unregulated. Transdermal testosterone therapy is indicated only for postmenopausal women with sexual desire disorder. And then it must be in a female appropriate dose, and that is really the problem. There are not really any female appropriate dosages, so you have to adjust from male dosages. Oral DHEA is not effective for the treatment of postmenopausal sexual dysfunction, and I will not recommend that. So if we go the other way around, what are our alternatives for our patient in question? Well, our medical therapy is basically the SSRIs, such as citalopram, skitalopram, fluoxetine, paroxetine, and sertraline, or the um, serotonin norepinephrine uh, reuptake inhibitors, such as duloxetine, venlafaxine, and this venlafaxine. But you'll all, with great respect, agree with me that the effect is not nearly as dramatic or as good as that of menopausal hormone therapy. The new kid on the block, is called Fizolantat, which is a neurokinin-3 receptor agonist, antagonist that blocks the neurokinin B binding on the kispeptin neurokinin or the dynorphin uh, neuron um, to modulate neuronal activity in the thermoregulatory center. This has been one of the great discoveries of the later time in which we now know that women who um, suffer from severe heart flashes and especially the ones who suffer from for a long time have overexpression of the neurokinin 3 receptor pathway in the brain and that goes right by the thermoregulatory center. The moment that estrogen drops you have over overexpression of this pathway giving home estrogen will temper it down, or you can block it with a non-hormonal drug like Fizolantan. And we're probably going to get more of these drugs, but just remember these drugs will only treat the hot flashes and it will not have any of the other beneficial um, effects of menopausal hormone thank, uh, therapy. Um, I think my 20 minutes is up, so I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Toby, for this very concise, informative, and very educational lecture. Our second distinguished speaker is Dr. Nozer Seria. Dr. Seria is an obstetrician and gynecologist with a long-standing commitment to the advocacy and promotion of women's rights and access to safe abortion. He practices in Mumbai, India, and he has served for many international organizations, including the WHO and the uh, FIGO, the Federation International for Gynecology and Obstetrics. He is the series editor of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Perspective, and his most recent book, Finding Your Balance, Your 36 uh, Degrees Guide to Perimenopause, is a holistic guide for women throughout their lives. So he's fully suitable to discuss with us the MHT Chronicles, the tailor-made solution in clinical uh, practice. No, sir. Thank you, Dimitrios. And uh, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to be a part of this webinar. EMS and Abbott, thank you. And to be here speaking with uh, you and with Toby, both presidents of two very important organizations that are special to us. Uh, Toby has given us a fantastic evidence-based overview, and I'm going to try and complement it with, uh, with a very practical clinician's approach. German Greer, the famous uh, feminist author, said you can't postpone the inevitable. The whole thing about women is that they change. Men, poor old things, seem to go on in their same group for their whole lives. So just to take you back in history, February 13th, Mrs. PG-52 visited Dr. Robert Wilson. Breast was supple and firm, carriage erect, good muscle tone, no genital atrophy, skin smooth, pliant as a girl's. Her cycles were perfectly regular and synchronized. 
We just had the birth control pill and someone forgot to tell Mrs. PG to stop taking them. This is in his book, Feminine Forever. He maintained that menopause was an estrogen deficiency state that should be treated with replacement. And he very crudely and obnoxiously termed this as the inevitable living DK. I don't know what would have happened to him if he lived in today's connected uh, social media world. So today I talk about some of my experiences and the modern mantras coming from India. Mantras are like the sacred chants for managing menopause. And, um, and uh, thank you, EMS, to allow us to speak on these practical aspects. Now, first, let's look at the elephant in the room. It's always there. It's never left us. The WHI study, Boone or Curse, and it's amazing how in a, a great study, five major studies of 160,000 women uh, brought so much negativism because of one arm of 16,000 healthy volunteers, 50 to 79 years. Maybe they were asking the wrong question, cardiovascular benefit, and that particular arm of the study was suspended. And this set us back by almost one and a half to two decades. When this was looked at uh, uh, in 2002, you realize that well, they highlighted and the media highlighted the negatives, they forgot to tell us that there were also a lot of positives. And a lot of the negatives that they highlighted, which were a very reasonable amount for the number of women per year, also were balanced off by the benefits with CA colon, C endometrium and hip factors. Uh, specifically looking at the cardiovascular risk, the first thing was uh, it was uh, shown that the wisdom and manner of terminating the trial was probably not wise. A harm was highlighted in relative, not absolute risk. The absolute risk is extremely small. And when a deep dive was done into the CHD, it was actually found that it was reduced in younger women and women less than 10 years since menopause. And there was this paper which showed that excess risk of CHD within 10 years was actually minus 6 per 10,000 person years and between 10 and 20 years was 4 per 10,000 women years. Looking at age 50 to 59 years, it was actually minus 2 and between 60 and 69 years minus 1. Suffice to say that this is something that we need to be prepared to discuss with the women we look after because what they are going to immediately ask us is what impressions they carry from the time. All the women we look after now were young women at the time the WHI media hit the world and they always have a lot of negative feelings for MHT. Now, Brandon Sanderson has said the purpose of a storyteller is not to tell you how to think but to give you questions to think about. And let me first tell you about this patient of mine. Uh, she was an amazing woman. Uh, now, this is this is a woman who was absolutely, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, right, she was in her mid sixties. She had to liver transplants in the UK. She was still symptomatic 15 years after menopause and she was on hormone therapy with estrogen patches. Uh, thankfully, she was a hysterectomized patient. Every time we stopped, she had a recurrence and she made an informed choice to continue hormone therapy because she felt that she deserved that quality of life. An atypical case, a complete outlier, maybe not the story to start this presentation with, but it highlighted for me that every woman is different and unique and has varied presentations and needs and solutions. So I will first start with vasomotor disturbance. Uh, this has been touched upon so well by Toby. And uh, there's this lovely quote which says, sunrise uh, paints the sky with pinks and sunset with peaches cool to warm. So is the progression to old age. This was my patient Kay, came to me when she was 42. Lovely woman, positive temperament, exercised regularly, amazingly fit, and suddenly her life was disrupted, distressing, uncontrolled bouts of flushing and sweating, still menstruating with irregular periods. FSH was 34, suggesting that she was perimenopausal. Workup was done, counseling was done, and she was started on menopause hormone therapy. Now, there is no secret that you start off with a lot of lifestyle modifications, a lot of advice. Women are smart. They make changes. They control temperatures at home. 
they dress smartly, but still this is something that will need more than just lifestyle management. The modern mantra is menstruating, perimenopausal women as discussed earlier. Well, you could just start off with the combined oral hormone contraceptive. And today you can continue using it to 45 and even 50 years. And personally, I have a preference for drosperinone, which has other benefits. The contraceptive patch, which isn't available to us in India, but I do have a lot of my patients who bring it from overseas, is a great option. If that isn't an option, progesterone-only pills work. Desogestrel and drosperinone are both aware, available to us. And finally, in the postmenopausal women, you have a combination of estrogen and progesterone with the uterus and estrogen alone without the uterus. But then there are women who are very reluctant and hesitant to take menopause hormone therapy, and they have every justification to ask for an alternative. And there are alternatives. The alternatives are, uh, for me, primarily what I use and have been using for some time is clonidine and gabapentin. Uh, effective, but usually takes some time before it takes effect. You can use SSRIs and SNRIs, already discussed by Toby earlier. I've just mentioned the doses here. Oxybutynin has been mentioned as an option uh, it is something that we very often use for urgent continence. And finally, this has been discussed, probably going to be one of the most uh, looked forward things uh, as far as we are concerned. Again, we have no access to it, is the first in class Eurokinin D antagonist. Now, I found a very interesting EMAS position statement on this. Uh, they talked about clonidine. Of course, I flipped it around to put it in the order that I usually use them. Approved for treatment for menopausal flushes in some countries, reduces flushes, but it takes some time, so don't give up. Gabapentin showed that even very low doses given twice daily decreased hot flushes, and of course, SSRIs, the paroxetine, and SNRIs such as venlafaxine are effective when menopause hormone therapy is contraindicated. The EMAS statement goes ahead to say that we have insufficient or conflicting evidence to suggest effectiveness of exercise, supplements, and phytoestrogens. But I would never write out any therapy. And if something's going to help a patient, even if it be in a placebo kind of a manner, so be it. Now, my patient was on MHD with estrogen, patches and progesterone, symptoms magically vanished. You know, women relieved of hot flushes consider us to be magicians, but let's face it, it's the estrogens that are our magician's props. She continued with it for four years and then she shifted to Tibalone for her well-being for 12 more years. You know, she is called Mrs. Sunshine in our practice. She continues to be a patient and a very dear friend 22 years on. Let's come to genitourinary health. You know, Laureen Carlfield has said, as our body journeys through life and life journeys on our body, life will leave marks on us too. So this was a very interesting, uh, different patient. She presented 15 years ago when she was 45 years old. She'd already been menopausal for the past year, bloated, tired, frequent urination, vaginal dryness, swelling. She was an isoflavones for two years already with limited relief. And she was treated back then. We had oral estriol and then tibolone for eight years. Her only complaint was now vaginal dryness and atrophy. And she was prescribed vaginal estrogens. Uh, sometimes she used a conjugated estrogen, other times estriol. Now, GSM includes VVA. And uh, it is very clear that we need to start treatment early. It's so sad that something that's this effective is used by so few women. In fact, it's said that maybe just about 10 or 20% of women who need it actually get onto this treatment. It has to be continued long term to maintain benefit. And there is minimal systemic absorption. Hence, there is no need for an additional progesterone, and it's found to be extremely safe even when systemic MHD is contraindicated. There is also a place for vaginal lubricants and moisturizers to relieve dryness. And of course, a uh, patient who, who, who is uh, willing uh, can be supported with a decision for regular sexual activity. So again, I found an EMAS clinical guide which told us that GSM includes VVA, affects 50% of postmenopausal women, affects quality of life, affects personal relationships, and needs an individualized approach. Topical low-dose estrogens are effective and safe. They may also, to some extent, alleviate incontinence and prevent recurrent UTIs. 
Long term use as long as treatment is of benefit. I often tell the women I care for, you don't ever need to stop them ever if this is benefiting you and safety data is extremely reassuring. Of course, non-hormone lubricants and moisturizers are mentioned in the clinical guide and are said to be the first line treatment even with adjunct therapies for hormone dependent cancers. Now, this patient of mine benefited greatly from estrogen creams, but for some reason, this very smart woman was just unable to use the applicator for intravaginal application. She's worked out that a fortnightly application does well for her. And for many years now, she visits the clinic twice a month for vaginal estrogen application. I know this sounds crazy and unscientific. Kay has shown me once more that women know best. And even though it may not seem very scientific, we shouldn't just hear them. We need to listen to them. And let's come to bone health. T.S. Eliot has said those fragments I have showed against my ruins. A was a 41-year-old with irregular menses, hyperandrogenism, hypothyroidism, and PCOS on treatment with, CO, with, a, with a COC with cyproterone acetate, and she was on flutamide. Of COCs, her FSH was 2.3, estriol was 192, and she was kept on this low-dose COC with drosperinone. Baseline DEXA at this time was osteopenia with minus 1.7 for a lower spine. So I did what we normally do, weight-bearing exercise, calcium, vitamin D supp supplements, and periodic vigilance. It has been shown that MHD in early postmenopausal period definitely has a role in prevention and treatment of osteoporosis. It has been shown that it prevents osteoporotic factors even in low risk increasing spine BMD by up to 7.5% and femur neck BMD by up to 4.5% over three years. It has been shown that it reduces fractures by up to 40%. And the fracture protective effect at standard doses is protection against and uh, with, with protection against BMD loss at lower doses. Of course, Tibilone is something that really has not been given its due and is definitely something we do use as a useful alternative. Now, what are all the other options we need to keep in mind, which are non-hormonal? Calcium, adequate supplementation where needed. The recommendation with MHD is about one gram and 1.5 grams without MHD. Vitamin D, let's face it, in India, we live in a very sunny country but not too many of our women venture out into the sun. So obviously vitamin D has to be supplemented wherever required and 250 milligrams of magnesium. But for patients, and I did see a question in the box, you definitely have the option of using therapies to protect bone to balance of the effect of osteoclasts versus the osteoblasts. So bisphosphonates, alendronate, resindronate, ebandronate, and zolendronate, zolendronic acid, Denosumab, these are the two I usually use in my practice. You also have the option of using SERMs, such as reloxifene and the parathyroid hormone, which is an anabolic effect. The EMAS position statement talks about bisphosphonates and denosumab, telling us that there is proven efficacy in reduction of vertebral and non-vertebral fractures. Over a very long period of time, there are concerns osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femoral fractures. And here they talk about a drug holiday. And this has often confused clinicians. How long do you go on with these treatments before you give them a break? It's considered after five years with alendronate, with risidronate, with zolendronate, and there is no recommendation for ibandronate. It is said that if there are no fractures before or during treatment, you could take a break after one to two years with risidronate three to five years with alendronate, and three to six years with zolendronate. According to this position statement, there is no robust recommendation for a drug holiday with denosumab, but a discontinuation, if it happens, should be closely monitored because of a risk of rebound fractures. She stopped COCs four years later, perspiration, hair loss, bone pain. Her FSH was now 20, was 21. She opted to resume COCs to the age of 50. COCs can play the role of MHT, particularly when it comes to dealing with perimenopause. And remember, these patients also need contraception. And most women at this point think and let their guard down and you land up with unwanted pregnancies. 
Ripidexa had a reduction to 0.24. She was put on residronate, which I prefer because it's once a month, 150 milligrams, which she is continuing to date and she is symptom free. A recent DEXA shows a slight improvement. Bisphosphonate you should be assessed periodically and we have decided to stop it at five years. And finally, I will briefly talk about sexual health. And Naomi Wolf has, has famously said, we do not have to spend money and go hungry and struggle and study to be sensual. We always were. We need not believe we must somehow earn good erotic care. We always deserve it. This was a 41-year-old single mother. She was a fitness buff and she was already a year into menopause at presentation. Committed to aerobic exercise, weight training. She looked and dressed like a woman much younger than herself, petrified of aging prematurely. We started her on hormone therapy with a patch and progesterone. We don't have the patch in India anymore, but we're using a lot of transdermal uh, gels and, and, and even uh, sprays. This was done with the five-year horizon. Now, we have to understand there are many categories of female sexual dysfunction. And I won't go into the details, but we have to classify this as a low desire, low arousal, orgasmic dysfunction. And what often is one of the most dis uh, disturbing aspects at this time, vulva pain, deep pain with penetration and tightening of pelvic musculature. So we have to consider that age, type of FSD and time since menopause, and also assess inter and intrapersonal factors. Because this is something that you can't see in isolation as an endocrine or a physical problem. The clinician must be committed to believe that sex that and should not believe that sex is not important for elderly women. And it's sometimes up to us to try the break the ice questions in clinical practice. And finally, we have to diagnose and routinely treat signs and symptoms of GSM BVA to avoid the vicious cycle between pain and other FSDs. Water-based personal vaginal lubricants is something we must speak about because these can be useful adjuvants in mild to moderate dryness and dyspareunia. There was a study which showed that a once a week use uh, that at least once a week use for four weeks actually improved the female sexual function index dramatically, and we could have preparations with hyaluronic acid gel available to us, water-based lubricants, my preference, and sometimes even local anesthetic gels. But what has really been of interest is this problem that women have with low libido. And when this, there is hypoactive kind of a sexual dysfunction, androgens seem to definitely have a place. There is evidence that androgens influence sexual function. They have the potential for sexual interest and arousal disorder. And for some time now, I have been using transdermal testosterone. Though I must confess, I always offer it to a woman as a trial, telling her that it's still early stages, explaining what the implications are. Though it's interesting that the IMS white paper in Climactric says that there definitely is proven efficacy and they do talk about uh, trying to maintain free testosterone and premenopausal range. I would go with the lowest possible dose and then gradually increase it and see if there is no improvement in three months, I'd probably drop it, but otherwise I would. As was told to us before, there is absolutely no place, doesn't seem to be a systemic DHEA is not effective. And the other drugs, one has been approved for treatment of dyspareunia and the other definitely is going to have a role for hypoactive sexual dysfunction. So with the withdrawal of the patch in India, we shifted her to estrogen progesterone therapy. She opted to continue it for a very long term, had concerns about painful sex and diminished libido. After 10 years, she was shifted to Tibalone uh, using local visnadine gel, lubricants, diligent condom use. And I must say that she continues to look younger with a very active sexual life, a role model for me, self-preservation, physical fitness and confidence in addressing our sexuality. So I'd like to end this presentation by, by quoting Pat Schroeder, who used to be a representative in the US House. And she said, if you get six menopausal women together, you find that their doctors are doing six different things. Our joke is you might as well go to a veterinarian. I don't think that's true. Thanks to organizations such as IMS and EMAS today, we've got very clear guidelines evidence-based guidelines to support us. And I think it's very important for us to keep up with them and track them out. 
I'd finally like to just end by quoting Catherine Mansfield, who said that I want to be all that I'm capable of becoming. And it's our responsibility as their caregivers to ensure this. Uh, this is a book that I wrote with a very, very dear friend. And I can tell you why it was so important to me, because she is a nutritionist and we managed to buy, bring a holistic balance. And I learned a lot in writing a book and putting my medical ego aside. So the book is at once very evidence-based medical, but also contains a lot of other stuff. My joke with her is our book is as though uh, modern medicine meets Ayurveda. Thank you. So thank you very much, Nozer, for this very comprehensive, informative, and very practical presentation. Dear colleagues, I must thank both of our invited speakers as they clarified many issues regarding the regimes, the dosages, the duration of treatment, and the adverse effects uh, during uh, menopausal hormone therapy. Nevertheless, a good lecture always provokes questions, so we are waiting for yours. Please use the Q&A widget located in your Zoom panel. And I think we have already our first questions. The first one uh, already mentioned about by our speakers, what are your views about the potential use of NK3 receptor antagonists for bothersome um, vasomotor symptoms now in the future? Uh, both of you have mentioned it. Uh, probably a, an additional word, Toby. Yeah, I think it is already available in the United States. Um, it Ironically, it is not at the moment registered for use in patients uh, being treated for cancer, especially breast cancer with an aromatase inhibitor, uh, just because the studies haven't been completed with that. But that's where I think the main um, indication would be in patients uh, symptomatic on treatment for breast cancer. But just as I said, always remember, you will just be treating vasomotor symptoms and you will not be getting any of the other advantages as both speakers have pointed out. And also, it's going to be, and it is very expensive in the United States. Um, so it's not for everyone, but it is certainly a magnificent stride forward. Thank you very much, Toby. Now, is there any additional comments by you? Uh, no, I, 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 I just have to, you know, go by what Toby says because we have absolutely no experience, and I don't know when this medication is going to be available to the rest of us outside the United States. It's true, mentioning even the, uh, the, the, the cost as mentioned by Toby. Uh, if the woman does does not have bothersome vasomotor or genitourinary symptoms, can biphosphonates be a better choice? Uh, I assume they mean uh, women with with osteoporosis. Toby, yeah, okay, it's 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 a very good question and touches upon quite a few things. Well, the first thing is just that, um, especially in the younger patient, estrogen hormone therapy, whether combined or alone, probably works as well, if not better, than any of the other drugs in the prevention of fractures. So certainly in the younger patient, even if she's not symptomatic, if it's purely for bone, that would be my choice. Now, I just want to touch upon one other thing, um, as um, unfortunately, I'm a bonehead, so I've got a lot to say about bone. But the bisphosphonates are not specific a good choice in a younger patient. Because if you think about osteoporosis, it's a lifetime disease, and you will have certain forms of treatment at certain phases of life. Your bisphosphonates, once it's been given, it will blunt the effect of any of the other anti-resorptives as well as your anabolic drugs. So to me, an a bisphosphonate is a drug that I mostly would end a treatment with before starting another cycle. So I would prefer to give either HRT or to give the nosumab before I give um, the uh, 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 bisphosphonate. I'd also, Moza, just just like to um, just remark a little bit on one of your things that you said that um, this, I think you said the jury is not out on a drug holiday in the nosumab. 
But in fact, there is no such a thing as a drug holiday in denosumab. The moment that you're going to stop denosumab, you're immediately going to start losing everything you're built up with a greater risk of fracture so than you had before you started off. So if you're going to stop it, and we normally will treat it till a three to target of a T-score of minus 1.5, then we normally plug it with something like zelendronate, but you can't just leave the patient. So drug holidays are not applicable to actually any of the other um, anti-resorbent drugs. The same principle goes for HRT. If you stop it, you're going to lose it. Um, and uh, also for your anabolics, if you're going to stop either um, teriparatide or romazosumab, um, you're also going to get just the same bone loss again. So they always have to be followed up by something else, normally often anabolic. I would use denosumab and then a bisphosphonate. Very nice, Toby. So as a rule of thumb, you would consider of giving HRT near menopause, especially to alleviate some symptoms. And then possibly later, it's time for denosumab and use bisphosphonate at the end of the treatment to seal this period, actually. And of course, if things are really difficult, you always have the osteoanabolic uh, treatment and we have more options. Um, very nice overview. Nozer, your thoughts about this? Yeah, so first of all, uh, I mean, I have to talk about where I come from with my experience in India. And the first thing I think as clinicians, we have to make uh, people understand is women lose bone and men lose bone. Women just lose bone faster than men when they're going through the transition, which is why they land up in a much worse situation. And, and management has to start with prevention when the woman is younger. And if she follows good practices and good life and builds up good bone health, she's probably going to be better off after the time that she goes through menopause. Now, our biggest problem in India, Toby, is the fact that denosumab is many, many times more expensive than the bisphosphonates. And uh, it is extremely important to understand that medical care, particularly long-term medical care, tends to be very price sensitive, which is why somehow in India, we do start off, of course, MHT first. There's no question. But MHT has its own issues, particularly with not every woman being open to taking it. And by the time women come to us, we don't have the same robust, uh, what should I say, screening uh, as happens in the Western world. So they do tend to come to us in osteoporosis. In that case, we do start with bisphosphonates. And if they do not tolerate bisphosphonates, which a small percentage of women just won't be able to because of the GI symptoms, then we somehow convince them to use something else. And very often that is denosumab. And then, of course, he very rightly said that there's, there's no reason to really stop it. And even though it's a blunted response after she's done with the bisphosphonates, we have no choice. But the ones who need to keep going may go on with denosumab. So we also have to be extremely uh, aware as to what the patient can take. My practice in Mumbai may be very different from the practice in other parts of India. But whatever costs, I mean, it's 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 uh, the but bisphosphonates are like, one fifth or one tenth the cost of denosumab, and uh, it would be difficult for me to use denosumab widely in my patients. I can okay. just also mention that your bisphosphonates are contraindicated if you have a glomerular filtration rate of less than thirty mils per hour. So in those patients, you really haven't got a choice because you you can't use it. So there is often, and there must always be a difference between ideal. Uh, practice of medicine and practical. So it's much better for a patient to have a bisphosphonate um, if she can't uh, afford the denosumab than not having anything at all. So I would completely concur with you there. But I'd just like to make the point that if you started with the bisphosphonate, you spoil the party quite a bit for anything that follows afterwards. Absolutely. Nice. Very nice to see all these um, approaches. Marosario asks, uh, can you discuss a little bit further on the use of Tibolon, especially compared to the combined hormonal uh, regimen? Nozer, your, your thoughts about Tibolon? 
Uh, so, so I think we've been fortunate that we did have Tibelon in India, though I must say that its use is uh, periodic because uh, for, for a long time it did go off the market when the company that mainly brought it in kind of withdrew it and an Indian company stepped in. So we still have it. Uh, I, 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 I believe it's a good option, but for me, it's usually MHD first. And very often, as I showed you in some of those patients who really wanted to go on for a very long time and who are hesitant, patients do have concerns about long-term MHD. Let's face it, they're, they are influenced by so many other factors in their life. So it's as though it's, got, it's an excellent option to continue. It has some benefits, the feeling of well-being, maybe the feeling that, that, that the sexual health and libido is a little better. Um, so we, we have used Sibylon. Of course, uh, I would say it's a very marginal use as compared to the use of MHD in my country. But there are those of us who've used it who are extremely satisfied with this drug. I think this is something that's quite unique to Europe. And thankfully, a lot of times what we do in India is we follow the European system of therapies and medicines a lot more than maybe across the uh, Atlantic. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nozer. And the women has to be rather postmenopausal rather than perimenopausal for Tibolone. Toby, your thoughts about uh, and your experience with the use of Tibolone? Oh, we have lots of experience with Tibolone. I think it's a, it's really a very useful drug. The main thing, as Moza alluded to, is that it is um, a pro drug that's metabolized in different tissues. And it goes to estrogen, progesterone, so it is a post um, uh, estrogen or, or hormonal therapy, but it also um, is metabolized to testosterone, but never to such an extent that you need to test it. So for the um, woman who presents with any menopausal symptoms and of which a loss of libido is a dominant symptom, it would be a, quite a good idea to, to um, have a look at that. But, I mean, there are some good data also about libido improvement just on normal combined therapy. And it, again, boils down to what Moses said just now, the cost. In South Africa, the cost of um, Tibolone is uh, about two and a half times as much as you can get for regular combined um, oral therapy. But there are now some genetics available to other genetics, which has bring the price down a little bit. As far as bone is concerned, it's a very useful drug. It's actually shown a 50% reduction in all type of fractures, but and it, it was given to patients the average age of 65 in the LIFT study. Unfortunately, there was a slight increased risk of um, the fatal strokes in those patients, although total stroke was the same. My personal opinion is that they then stopped promoting it for that use. Um, and I think that was a bit of a premature decision. But I would, in any case, be hesitant to start a patient for bone therapy on any hormone therapy at 65. So, But in the younger patients, certainly uh, excellent bone drug as well. Thank you very much. Alina Kuznitsova asks about what is the upper limit for oral estradiol in context of premature ovarian insufficiency treatment uh, when uh, it will be corrected, correct to prescribe three or four milligrams. I assume she asked that if uh, you are using the estradiol concentration in the blood in order to tailor the dosage of your treatment, especially in women with premature ovarian insufficiency, and if this is, would be an indicator to use a higher dose, such as three, four, five, or six uh, milligrams of estradiol. No, sir? So the first thing that we have to accept that any woman with premature ovarian insufficiency is an exception. In this case, menopause hormone therapy is mandated. It's not really optional. And she can also be reassured that all evidence shows that it seems to be much safer in all parameters when it comes to this woman and she will take it for as long as it takes till the age of what natural menopause might have been for her. So there's absolutely no compromise. There are no breaks. Uh, I, I would usually, I mean, we don't, we don't test levels when once you've confirmed premature ovarian insufficiency, 
But I believe that when you work with the patient and you treat her symptomatically, she is the best judge as what is the dose that works for her. Now, in premature ovarian insufficiency, sometimes by the time they come to us, particularly in our country, they have been amenoric for a very long time when you make the diagnosis and she shows that there's hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, premature ovarian failure, she is young, by which time, you know, you have a uterine size, which is extremely small. And in this particular case, we would usually start off with therapy at a level which I don't even need a progest progestrogen withdrawal because I really want her to spend some time with the estrogen, with the secondary sex characters and whatever, which might have taken a hit over time. Once I get a good endometrial thickness, then comes in the progestrogen. And most of these women are extremely happy to be menstruating because it makes them feel complete. So whatever dose it takes for their symptoms, whatever dose it takes to give them their regular menstruation and take them through the time when she would probably have reached natural menopause, whether it's 45 or 50, that's something you decide with that particular woman. Of course, these women have also got to understand that besides the fact that we can take care of their endocrine needs, many of these women also have reproductive needs. And today, thankfully, with assisted reproduction, each and every one of these women can be, uh, you know, is entitled to a pregnancy and oocyte donation has made that a complete reality. A big part of this is, uh, is the discussion and the counseling. I had a lovely story, which I couldn't increase for want of time. A young woman who came to me, met a guy overseas, was very hesitant to break this news to the family, comes to me with a potential mother-in-law. And I just told her that this woman is so brave. She could have just been taking the medications and you wouldn't have known. And you don't worry. You want to be a grandmother. She's going to be a mother. And, and we, we are there. But counseling is extremely important. They have to be told that there's nothing to be ashamed about. This is a medical condition. It's something that's happened to her. And we have all the resources possible to make for her, a very, very normal reproductive life. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Nozer. Toby, your contribution to it, your thoughts? I, th I agree with everything that, that Moses said. Just for simplicity, um, starting, I said that we, and Moses also said you start lowest and then you titrate up. If you start in the postmenopausal patient using ethanol estradiol, um, you start at one milligram and then dose uh, of two milli sorry one milligram and go up and in the uh, POI patients you start at two and then go up um, but you would hardly ever justify using anything like four milligrams uh, it's either one or two um, it's exceptional to be having to use more than that uh, you are mentioning ethinyl estradiol not a uh... Uh, 17 vitae stradiol. Eh? I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. That was a slip of the tongue. I'm yeah, definitely yeah. referring to 17 beta estradiol. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you sorry, very much. That was just a slip. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Uh, so we could continue. I would uh, uh, give the opportunity to ask a couple of more questions. Uh, what your opinion about bioidentical hormones? Sometimes it's a need by by the patients, Toby. Ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I can go on about this for an hour. I'll just shortly say no, don't use it. There's absolutely no reason to use it. You have a better choice in terms of what's available, pharmaceutically grade, um, being approved by everyone, um, having a a profile having been tested, there's absolutely no advantage in going the so-called bioidentical route. Um, the word bioidentical is, in any case, uh, it's not a scientific term. Um, it is a pure marketing term. If you want to talk about um, the natural occurring hormones, then rather call it body identicals. And the body identicals are then your E2 and um, your progesterone, or, um, and those are the the, 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 the true ones. And uh, you get them in all size and shapes and all tested. So why on earth would you go anything else? It's um, a pure, I think, uh, money-driven exercise. 
Thank you, Toby. I could see that Nozer was uh, agreeing with you, but Nozer, any any additional I mean, thought? Thank, thankfully, we, we don't have these available in India, but we do get patients coming to us who've started this treatment at centers overseas. And believe me, when they come to us, besides the fact that it just doesn't make scientific sense, and uh, I would always try and point it out by showing them evidence, uh, they sometimes come completely messed up. There's one story in the book where this patient of mine came being on bioidentical therapy in the UK, and it took us a very, very long time to get her sorted out. And then, of course, she was on HRT, which was much uh, MHT, which was much, much more reasonable, much more scientific, much more affordable. And I, I think we need to be very clear. Sometimes we tend to be very kind and we allow patients a lot of latitude. I think that has to be something we draw a line with. And thankfully, you've given us all the all the evidence to show them which organization hasn't written or spoken about this particular issue extremely emphatically and clearly. Very nice. Thank you for your clear question. And I'm going to ask a, a final one. Uh, why you, would you consider or would you consider combined oral contraceptive with drosperinone as a better choice over uh, menopausal hormone treatment? Uh, I'm not sure if she's asking about a lady with a premature ovarian insufficiency, most probably this, uh, rather than a, a lady with a natural menopause, I would say. So, uh, Nozer, your thoughts about I'm, the I, 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 I'm talking about women who are in their early 40s who technically haven't reached menopause. They are still menstruating. They have all the symptoms. Because, you know, with the perimenopause and the premenopause, when you look at the stroke classification, symptoms can start before that last menstrual period and 12 months of no menstruation. This woman also needs contraception. Now, she has her options with LARC, long-acting reversible contraception. The LNG IUS would be a great option, but that's not going to help her with the symptoms. Primarily, many of these symptoms may be vasomotor, some of these patients may have a lot of PMS symptoms, which may extend into the mid-cycle at this time. They have, uh, and let's face it, we do know that uh, this particular preparation has been approved by the US FDA for PMDT, which is the most severe form of PMS. So this is specifically at that targeted at that woman who is not yet menopausal, but getting close to it, who is very symptomatic where you give her contraception, you give her protection, she's not letting her guard down. And at the same time, the same method gives her benefits with, with everything you, she needs. She needn't menstruate every month. She can choose to menstruate every two or three months. That's her choice. The drosperinone helps great with the bloating. Uh, in every which way you get the benefits at this early time. I am not recommending it for a woman who is menopausal. That's when I would want to go to MHT. I'm not going to give that woman ethanolestradiol, but let's face it, we've sorted that thing out completely. And I would not give it to a woman with premature ovarian insufficiency. That woman gets MHT. She does not get the, the, the combined hormonal contraceptive, be it a patch, be it oral, be it whatever, be it a ring. She gets, as was very rightly said, you know, something that, 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 that's as far as I'm concerned, estradiol and micronized progesterone and didrogestone are as close to natural and effective as you can get for these women. Very clear. And Toby, your, your thoughts about it? I think we have lost Toby uh, for a little bit. We can continue forever, actually. and. Toby, you are now with us. Yeah, again. sorry. We Absolutely just, uh, no problem. It's just a couple of seconds. So uh, let's close with this. Your, your thoughts about uh, possible use of uh, combined oral contraceptives? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I basically agreed with the bit that I heard from, from Noza there. And, but this is the combined oral contraceptive is for a patient with perimenopausal symptoms. And as he said, not for postmenopausal. So what you actually want to do there is you, you want to suppress the erratic FSH and um, LH values and present the patient with a stable platform of your, your, your hormonal compounds. But we don't do that after the menopause. Um, the specific... Um, 
combination with drosperinone, as I said, has been approved for the uh, premenstrual tension, so it probably would be a good choice. I was just thinking that, um, I don't know in Europe whether you already have the estetrol containing um, oral contraceptives available. Um, that may be a, a place where you can start thinking about the estetrol companion ones. I'm just giving that as a thought because we haven't got it yet, so I haven't studied it well enough. Thank you very much. Thanks to your clear presentation and answers that were so clearly, uh, questions that are so clearly answered. We could continue forever, but we have to uh, to, to to go to, to, to an end. So dear colleagues, we have arrived at the end of today's webinar. I do hope that thanks to our speakers, we are now much wiser regarding the prescription of the estrogen, progesterone regimes being the most suitable actually for each uh, woman. I remind you that today's webinar will be shortly accessible on the IMAS website. This is the last IMAS webinar of the year. We will return with a new series next year. In the meantime, everyone can rewatch past webinars free of charge on the IMAS website and our YouTube channel. Plus, we have our ongoing podcast, podcast series. So thank you very much, all of you, for your kind attention. Bye-bye. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Privileged.